The House January 6th committee released a trove of new information today, a new batch of deposition transcripts, including unreleased testimony from former White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson and former White House aide John McEntee, who testified that Donald Trump wanted a blanket pardon for everyone involved on January 6th. Trump floated the idea, and former White House counsel Pat Cipollone said no. The transcripts add to the 845-page report released by the committee Friday detailing the extent of Trump's plot to overturn the election, alleging that Trump or his inner circle engaged in at least 200 apparent acts of public or private outreach, pressure, or condemnation targeting state officials to overturn election results. That includes 68 meetings, phone calls, or texts aimed at state or local officials, 18 public remarks targeting them, and 125 social media posts. The report also provided damning evidence about Trump's state of mind during the attack. According to the report, as the violence was underway, a Trump aide, Robert Gabriel, texted someone, POTUS, I'm sure, is loving this. The decision whether or not to pursue criminal charges against Trump now lies with the Justice Department, but the committee made recommendations on how to prevent another January 6th from happening, notably urging congressional committees to examine a formal mechanism to evaluate barring Trump and others mentioned in the report from holding future office under the 14th Amendment. Joining me now, Charles Coleman, civil rights attorney, MSNBC legal analyst and host of the Char Charles Coleman podcast, and Tim O'Brien, senior executive editor at Bloomberg Opinion and an MSNBC political analyst. Thank you both very much for coming to the readout. Tim, um, I think it's interesting that we have now, we saw reporting in real time, but now we have it in the report, a blanket pardon. Trump wanted a blanket pardon for people who were involved on January 6th. You're, you are an attorney. You know that. You hear that. It's in an official government report. What do you think that does over at DOJ? Well, people don't seek pardons unless they think they've committed a crime. And if the president of the United States is seeking a pardon for several to a multitude of people in his own administration, it suggests that he was worried he committed a crime or the people around him may have committed a crime or the people around him may be able to testify against him in a court of law. Uh, it's also interesting that his own attorneys advised him not to do this, because I think it's, it, 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 it suggests guilt. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it should surprise anybody that, that Trump sought to do that. I don't think it should surprise anybody that people in his own administration were looking for a pardon as the clock was ticking out on his tenure in the White House. But of course, the American public should worry about it, because as the January 6th report showed, um, the January 6th event wasn't a single day event. It was premeditated. There was planning for it that began months before that date. There were activities that continued after that date. And it was a criminal conspiracy. Mm -hmm. And I think the act of seeking a pardon is just another indication of possible guilt. And, and Charles, I would love to get your view on that. But also in that, in the transcripts, we have um, transcripts from a bunch of people, not just Cassidy Hutchinson, but Ali Alexander, um, the Stop the Steal organizer, Brad Raffensperger, Eugene Scalia, who at the time was Labor Secretary, and also Steve Mnuchin, who was Treasury Secretary. And in his transcript, um, the notes that they briefly discuss the 25th Amendment. And so you see there. So again, my conversations with Secretary Pompeo, it came up very briefly in our conversation. We both believed that the best outcome was a normal transition of power, which was working. And neither one of us contemplated in any serious format the 25th Amendment. We should point out that in, in um, Secretary Scalia's transcript, he denied conversations about the 25th Amendment. But you put all... I would love your le your legal analysis of both this conversation, whether it was serious or not, about the 25th Amendment, on top of Trump saying, hey, blanket pardons for everybody. Well, you know, Jonathan, I think that there are two different ways to look at this. And Tim hit the nail right on the head with his remarks about the fact that a large part of what we are seeing here is a person who is embattled with the truth, does not want to face it, and is insistent upon using every means at his disposal to go about exploiting different parts of our Constitution and different parts of the law 
albeit illegally, to try to maintain power. And I think that on a certain level, there's the shock and the awe that's associated with that. But legally, when you get into what the actual report says, you start to see how well-coordinated an effort that this was and how widespread a campaign that it was and that it was extremely intentional and that there cannot be any question about the outcome that it was intended and engineered to affect. And so all of these things put together, particularly when you start talking about the 25th Amendment, whether serious or not, these are relatively obscure pieces of the U.S. Constitution that most people don't even know about, let alone openly discuss. And the fact that there may have been a discussion, to me, signifies and indicates that there was a clear intention to try to find a loophole, try to find an avenue, a crack, a window, something that was going to allow Donald Trump to hold on to power, which he was not lawfully entitled to. Uh, Charles, let me get you on one more thing, and that's uh, that was Trump's state of mind. And as I read before, Robert Gabriel, a, a Trump aide, texted to someone else, POTUS, I'm sure, is loving this. Um, what does his state of mind, how does that play in, um, say, what DOJ is, could be considering in its own investigations into January 6th and Trump's role? Well, looking at it as a former prosecutor, Jonathan, what I will say is that anything that you can do to bring in the notion of state of mind, you're going to, to bolster the question of intent. And in this case, if Donald Trump were to ever be tried, prosecuted, and this were to be litigated in court, one of the key elements that's going to be necessary for the government to prove is establishing the actual intent that Donald Trump had in affecting the outcome which ultimately resulted. And so things like this, testimony like this, while another person is not going to actually be able to testify as to another person's frame of mind or what it is that they thought or intended at the time, what you can do is put this all together in a way that tries to paint a picture to a jury, to a judge, to a court that says, listen, this guy was fully aware of what it was that he was doing. He continued to do it. He had opportunities to stop it. And he didn't because he had the requisite intent necessary to commit the crimes for which he is being prosecuted for. Mm -hmm. And that's how you use that as a prosecutor and, and ultimately its value and its weight that Jackson is going to be looking at. Mm -hmm. Tim, NBC News is reporting that Trump's tax returns are going to be released uh, to the public on Friday. This is coming from the House Ways and Means Committee. And we already know from the New York Times uh, that Trump paid $1.1 million in taxes during his presidency, but zero in 2020. Um, I would... What, <laughs> I'm just trying to understand you know, what recourse... Does the, does the public have finding out that a former president of the United States paid, well, not only paid zero taxes in, in, in 2020, but we also know that the IRS didn't do its, fulfill its legal obligation to audit his taxes when he was president? Yeah, it left you a little speechless because you pay your taxes, don't you? And so it's strange <laughs> yeah. when a, when a self-proclaimed billionaire decides that he doesn't have to pay any. And as, now that we have the documentation, we know that in some years, he paid none uh, while he was proclaiming to stand up for average Americans who have to pay a big chunk of their own income in taxes. Um, I think what we know so far about the tax returns, there's a massive institutional failure at the IRS. There is supposed to be a mandatory audit of presidents. It, uh, it occurred during the Obama administration, and, and Biden has already been subjected to it, but somehow, magically, Donald Trump was not audited, even though he has a more complex flex financial picture and arguably more income than either one of those men. So why didn't it happen? It's either because the IRS is inept or it's because the IRS was in the tank. Either answer is not a good answer. So the IRS needs to be scrutinized for dropping the ball on this. More broadly, I think I think the, the, the larger problem we have with Donald Trump's tax returns are not simply the last six years of his tax returns, it's the last 30 years of his tax returns. We don't have a good picture on the kind of foreign or domestic financial influence that came to bear on him before, during, and even now, before and during his presidency, and even now. And this is not a partisan issue. If we believe in good government, whether a president is a Democrat or Republican, they should be financially transparent so we know that they are not conflicted when they're making public policy. And we still don't have enough years of returns from Donald Trump to get a full sense of that. And it remains a national security issue, and it remains an issue around good government. And I think this release should be the first chapter. It shouldn't be the last step. Tim O'Brien, 
Charles Komen. Thank you both very much for coming to the readout. <laughs>